Hi, everybody. My name is Osman or Az Ahmed. I'm an interventional radiologist at the University of Chicago. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with you about interventional radiology or IR treatments for metastatic liver tumors. So briefly, what is interventional oncology? So interventional radiologists who specialize in cancers such as myself are also known as interventional oncologists. And this is, uh, includes a wide variety of treatments or procedures that range from very basic to complex. So those basic procedures can be things that you probably have heard of, things like needle-guided biopsies or placing chest ports so that patients can get chemotherapy. But in addition to that, we do a wide variety of complex procedures, and that could range from anything from directly delivering chemotherapy or radiation to tumors, which is known as chemoembolization or radioembolization, burning tumors, which is known as ablation, injecting cement into bone to reinforce it, which is known as cementoplasty, as well as other things that are sort of cancer related, such as removing blood clots secondary to cancer. So what are the benefits of interventional oncology or IO? Um, the benefits are that because we are really able to be targeted with our treatments, we can maximize the ratio of tumor kill or damage to collateral damage. So we can really, you know, if we can hone in on very specific parts of the body, we can give much higher sort of quantities or amounts and reduce the systemic side effects, that, you know, when you compare it to just giving it through an IV, for example. So that really allows us to minimize the damage to the healthy tissue, but also give a lot more to the tumor itself. And because everything we do is minimally invasive, for the most part, everything we do is, you know, less than one or two millimeters in size, whether it's a needle or a catheter that goes into the blood vessel, that usually means quicker procedures and a shorter hospital stay. So almost everything that we do in IR is outpatient and or typically a 23 hour observation where we just watch you overnight to make sure you don't have any pain or anything like that. And more often than not, these treatments are a one-time deal. So you sort of see me once and don't have to put up with multiple procedures and things like that. And because of that, it, it's relatively cost-effective. So hospital systems like this as well. And the best part of this is that it's personalized. So everything that we do, we do it very specific and we tailor it to the patient's cancer themselves. So whether it's giving radiation or burning tumors, everything we do is very specific and individualized to the patient. So what are the downsides of what we do? Um, because not everything that we do, unfortunately, is, is perfect or suitable for all patients. First of all, you know, as we mentioned, what we do is targeted therapy. And because of that, it means that it's not systemic or it doesn't involve treating the whole body. I don't unfortunately have the ability to do that. So if you have widespread cancers, unfortunately, you often are not a candidate for some of the things that I am able to offer. And the other reason is that sometimes patients may not be candidates because of the anatomy that's presented to them. So sometimes a tumor can be very difficult to get to in the body, or they have pre-existing conditions. They just wouldn't be able to tolerate even a minimally invasive procedures. And one of the other, you know, sort of quote unquote downsides is that this is a relatively new field. You know, it is one of the reasons why I got into it is because it's tremendously exciting and innovative. And I, you know, I believe it's the future of medicine, but because of its sort of newness um, relative to other uh, specialties like medicine and surgery, there's a lot less data. So there's a lot more that we need to understand before we can sort of raise our flag and say that this, these are the best treatments for everybody. So, you know, interventional oncology is often, you know, where I'm often working is in the liver. And there's, uh, you know, a couple reasons why that is, you know, the liver is a very unique organ. So the first reason that it's unique is that it's incredibly resilient. It has this remarkable ability to repair and regenerate itself. And we see this with, you know, alcoholics, you know, it, you have to drink for many, many, many years before you can sort of go into liver failure. The reason that is, is because the liver can sort of take a punch and then regenerate itself and bounce back. And the other reason it's unique is that it derives its blood flow from two different uh, sources. So most things in our bodies just get blood flow from one source, and that's usually an artery. But in the liver, you actually get blood flow from an artery as well as a vein known as the portal vein. And that is really unique. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of talk about why that is. So what are the treatments that I am able to offer as an interventional radiologist or oncologist? There's really two main methods of treatment uh, for what we do in the liver. And we can really divide them up into transarterial therapies and percutaneous ablation. So transarterial therapies means that we go through blood vessels and specifically the arteries to get to the tumor. And percutaneous ablation, which is we take the sort of the most direct path directly from the skin to the tumor with a needle. So for transarterial interventions, we really rely on the concept of the dual blood supply in the liver. And we're lucky because in the liver, the normal liver is actually gets most of its blood flow from the portal vein, whereas 
tumors almost exclusively get their blood supply from the artery. And so we capitalize on that principle by going into the arteries and staying away from the veins and shutting those arteries down and, and effectively killing the tumor in the process. So what we do is procedures called embolization. And embolization is a very fancy word for shutting the, the tumor blood supply down or just shutting blood supply down in general. So this is sort of a cartoon schematic of what happens. So as you can see here, the red branches that you see, those are what the arteries look like on an angiogram. And as you can see, there's specific arteries that feed the tumor. And in general, because the tumors get their blood supply only from the arteries, they're like vacuum cleaners. They're very, very what we call hypervascular. They have a lot of blood vessels that go to them. So, you know, this is the liver. As you can see, the red is the artery and there's branches that are going to the tumor itself. And this is what it looks like on a CT scan. We can look at the CT scan and we can figure out what are the arteries that feed that big shiny object there that's unfortunately a tumor? And we map out how we're going to get there. And then what we do is we bring our patients to the x-ray IR suite and we do an angiogram where we actually put a small tube or catheter into the arteries of the liver and we inject dye. And this is what the angiogram looks like. And as you can see, there's the tumor or the death star looking object there. And we need to then navigate a small catheter into the arteries that specifically feed that tumor. And again, the yellow arrow sort of highlights the path that we need to take to get to the tumor. And once we get to that, that's where we now are going to sort of maximize our tumor kill and minimize our collateral damage. We're able to inject anything through that catheter, whether that's beads, radiation, or even chemotherapy. And depending on what we inject, that's sort of the name of the procedure. So the first procedure that we can do is, is something called radioembolization or Y90. Other terms that you may also hear are TEAR, transarterial radioembolization, as well as something called CERT, selective internal radiation therapy. These are all interchangeable. They're all fancy words for injecting radioactive beads. When you inject radioactive spheres or beads and perform radioembolization, these really can be a very effective way of killing tumor. They actually emit radiation for up to two weeks, and you can give really, really high doses of radiation because, again, you're really parking the catheter right in front of the tumor, and you're sort of blasting the tumor with radiation and really not giving much radiation to anywhere else in the body. And again, it's unlike external radiation where it has to go through the skin and you can get potential toxicity from that. And again, as we've mentioned in the past, these patients are discharged the same day as the procedure, although this is a sort of a two separate outpatient procedures, but again, minimally invasive in nature. So here's an example of what that looks like. This is a patient that had metastatic neuroendocrine cancer from the pancreas, uh, as well as carcinoid syndrome. And this is what a CT scan looks like in different projections. But if you can allow me to point out for you with these red arrows, these are what tumors look like. And they look like some of the images I've shown before, just sort of big round objects. And, and in general, they tend to take up a lot of blood flow. So they tend to be bright on the scans. And this is another MRI showing sort of a similar thing. This is a, a little bit easier to see. And then this is what it looks like on the angiogram. And you can see here in this liver, there's a bunch of those big round spheres, and those are all tumors. And it doesn't matter how many tumors you have because we can put the catheter as close to the branches that feed all of them and then inject the radiation. This is what it looks like. So the tumors don't necessarily go away, but we expect them to shrink. And then more importantly, we expect them to look like burnt out light bulbs. As we talked about that, they get a lot of blood supply, so they typically look very bright. But when we treat them and when we kill them, they may not go away, but then they're not alive anymore. So they're not bright. And this is the two-year follow-up for that patient as well. So the other treatment that we very commonly do, for, especially for neuroendocrine patients, is something called bland embolization. And with bland embolization, we're administering plain or bland beads. And that's why it's sort of called bland embolization as opposed to radio embolization. And what this does is actually just plugs up the arteries and, and starves the tumor of its blood supply and, and causes tumor necrosis. And this is really effective. And we really like this for neuroendocrine cancer because it, it works very well because the tumors are very hypervascular, as we talked about. And we can actually put in really, really small beads, as small as 40 microns. So they're really, really tiny and they go all the way to the really, really small arteries that feed the tumor. And so it really gives us a good tumor kill. And typically we use bland embolization for neuroendocrine cancer patients because their livers are much healthier and the prognosis for neuroendocrine cancer is much better. So we want to be able to do something uh, that's sort of better tolerated by the liver itself. Again, we talked about the liver's ability to regenerate and repair itself and bland embolization really allows the liver to do that. So if you look at this MRI, this liver is actually studded with tumors. All those sort of target looking lesions are tumors and greater than 80% of the liver is replaced by tumors. So oftentimes docs or patients will ask, can you treat this liver? And the, the answer is, 
almost always is yes. As long as the liver function is normal, which as we talked about, the liver is very resilient and the patient is doing well health-wise, we can treat this patient. And this is uh, what allows us to sort of uh, do this and, and be minimally invasive. So as you can see here, this is the angiogram again. This is going to be a sort of a common theme. You can see here, this is what it looks like, you know, especially after we inject dye and then we watch it like a movie in real time. And you can actually see there's multiple tumors. Again, this liver is sort of studded with tumors. And this is what it looks like after we embolize it. And so as you can see here, there is no more of that dense blush that we saw before, but we still have blood flow to the liver itself. And so we aim for this, what we call pruning. You know, So if you imagine all those tumors are like apples in the tree, we're trying to prune the branches, tr prune the leaves and just leave the sort of the trunks behind. And you can see here, the blood flow is still preserved to the liver. You can see here that the tumors are no longer are lighting up or enhancing. And again, you can see here, this patient returns a month later and we, we, we do the other side of the liver. And again, you can see all these tumors. And this is what it looks like after, you know, the embolization. And again, these intra-arterial therapies we use when, when patients have multiple tumors. We also use them for tumors that are very, very large or ones that are close to critical structures like the diaphragm that might be difficult to reach with what we call ablation. So there's another large tumor there. And again, you don't have to be an expert in imaging to see that there's a giant you know, tumor here. And so we can go up through the arteries directly to that tumor. And again, you can see here we're injecting essentially directly that tumor, that giant mass there, and we're going to shut the blood flow down to that tumor and perform bland embolization. And you can see here after we do that, there's no more blood flow. It's basically burnt out light bulb again. And we hope to see that on the follow-up imaging. And again, you can see here, there's the burnt out light bulb. So moving forward, the second primary treatment that we can offer for our patients is something called percutaneous ablation. And ablation is a, a, a relatively fancy term for taking a needle and putting it directly into a tumor and either heating or freezing it. And depending on what we do, whether if we heat it, that's called RFA or microwave, or if we freeze it, it's called cryoablation. But there's also what we call non-thermal ways to treat tumors. And, and most common one we use is something called IRE or irreversible electroporation, where we're electrocuting a tumor. And, you know, so I'll show you an example. This is an example of a microwave ablation of a tumor where we take a needle into the tumor, you burn it. And again, same light bulb concept. We're looking for uh, a zone of dead tissue or non-enhancing tissue afterwards. So here's another example you can see here. This is a tumor. It's actually right up against a big blood vessel known as the IVC. But because it's small enough, we're able to still ablate this. You can see I've highlighted it with the red circle. So we bring this patient and we do this under CT guidance. So we, we scan the patient just like we would do a normal CT scan. We identify the tumor right there, and then we guide a needle into it. And again, this is sort of the, the Cliff Notes version. This is after a few different repositions. But once that needle is in place, it's as simple as putting the needle there and, and plugging it into the machine and burning it for usually anywhere between five and 10 minutes. For this one, probably we did six or seven minutes. And there's the needle in the target. And this is what it looks like. It's very small. You know, it's a size, if not smaller than a pencil. So it's very minimally invasive. We just place a Band-Aid at the end. And then this is what we're looking for at the end. You can see there's a big sort of zone of dead tissue. It's black. Um, it's not enhancing. So when we inject the dye, there's no dye being taken up. And so in general, we do ablation when there's only a few lesions because it's very cumbersome to do it for more than three lesions in general. And we can really only do it for smaller tumors. Less than three centimeters is sort of the ideal size. Finally, you know, I want to talk about um, something I think I spoke about last time, which is, can we make ablation even safer? So every technology currently for ablation that we use still requires taking a needle, putting it through the skin and putting it into the liver. And, you know, as minimally invasive as that is, it's still invasive. It still requires the skin to be broken. So there's a new technology known as histotripsy that we're really excited about that's, you know, emerging that may eliminate that process and actually make the procedure even safer and take a procedure from being minimally invasive to, you know, completely non-invasive. And it also has uh, no radiation as well. So it's non-invasive, but and, and also non-radiative. So it's really, really sort of an attractive uh, technology for that reason. And the way it works is actually just uses ultrasound beams to create something known as cavitation. And it sort of can destroy tissue by focusing these ultrasound beams on the tumor itself. And it does that by sort of creating what we call like a bubble cloud that leads to cavitation and tumor destruction. And what's really, really exciting about histripsy is that it um, has the ability to preserve any critical structures that may be nearby. So it seems to work really well for tumors and also be protective for non-tumor type tissues that happen to be like blood vessels and bile ducts and things like that. So it has this ability to, to, to be very safe. 
And this is what it looks like. This is without putting a needle into the liver itself. And this is from an animal study we did. You can see that it actually shells out a core of tissue without actually ever putting anything in the body. And this is an actual example of a patient. You can see here the treated tumor, the burnt out tumor or light bulb, and there's a blood vessel actually running right through it. So what's the current status of histotripsy? People are often asking me, and you know, I will say that we are optimistically awaiting an FDA approval. We believe that that's going to happen soon, and so our fingers are crossed about that. And once that commercial device is in place, that will really allow us to offer this treatment to more patients and be able to be a little bit more liberal with who we're able to do. And what's also really exciting is that we're going to hopefully be able to do studies to see if histotripsy can do something which a lot of therapies are trying to do, which is to help unlock the immune system to work really well with what are called immunotherapies, which are the new sort of types of cancer therapies that work to, instead of being like chemotherapy, they actually work to sort of wake up the immune system and make the immune system attack the tumor itself. And so histotripsy has shown in some early studies that it actually can rev up the immune system and, and work synergistically with, with immunotherapy. And so we're really excited about that you know, potential as well. So I'm going to conclude here and just say that interventional or IR or interventional oncology therapies play a large role for neuroendocrine cancer patients with liver only or liver dominant disease. Again, we talked about how we can really focus on specific organs and the liver is, is really one of those sweet spots. And the two treatments that we really offer are intra-arterial therapies and percutaneous ablation. And within those umbrellas, there's multiple different procedures that, as we went over. And you know, the, the other major takeaway is that the liver is a resilient organ that can withstand a lot due to its ability to regenerate and its dual blood supply. And that really allows us to treat all types of patients that have you know, cancer in the liver, no matter if they have one tumor or hundreds of tumors. So I'll stop there. As many of you may know, I'm pretty active on social media. So feel free to, to contact me there and or email me anytime. I'm happy to connect with anyone.